Good evening, and welcome to another night of T's and Z's, a podcast to help you fall asleep. I am your host, Scott Elchison. Doug, my co-host, is here as well. Glad to be here once more. Two for two. It's going It's going well. If you're a new listener, just tuning in to T's and Z's for the first time, uh, let me break down the show concept for you. It's a conversation uh, that you can tune into as you start to wind down and then slowly tune out as you fall asleep knowing full well you're not going to be missing anything important because we discuss lengthy legal documents and agreements known as terms of service. You're never going to read these in the first place. We're not exactly sure why we're reading them, other than the fact that they're probably the most boring documents we can think of uh, for a sleep podcast. So this is the background, the concept behind T's and Z's. So so welcome. Uh, and let's just jump right into tonight's episode. So Doug, tonight we're talking about something that's a, you know, a hot topic. Uh, NFTs have been just all over the place. And so we're going to be breaking down Nifty Gateway, which is one of the uh, larger marketplaces where you can buy and sell NFTs or non-fungible tokens, uh, their terms of use. Do you own an NFT, Doug, by chance? Have you dabbled in the world of Ethereum and digital goods yet? I do not currently own, as I'm about to also really expose my lack of knowledge about what exactly an NFT is, but I do not own anything that I think resides on a blockchain ledger. Um, that's what they are, right? They're, that's like the whole concept of them. They can't be reproduced because once they're on that ledger, like it's, they're the most unique thing. I forget how it all works. Eh, bad, sort of. Yeah. Basically. I said the right buzzwords. Yeah. Yeah. You're, yeah. You nailed all the buzzwords. Basically, they are just. Uh, well, the whole idea of an NFT is a way to kind of give scarcity and ownership to digital goods, which, as we know in the past, are kind of hard to claim ownership on on the internet. So that's the basic concept around an NFT. And if you want to buy an NFT or make an NFT and sell it, you have to go to one of these marketplaces to do those transactions. And so Nifty Gateway seems to be one of the, like I said, the top competitors in that space for uh, essentially facilitating the sale. Well, I just I should say uh, facilitating the environment or creating the marketplace for individuals to buy and sell um, NFTs. And I think that's actually going to bring us into the very first section around their uh, terms of use, which is section one, accepting these terms. And I want to just jump right into this one sentence here because I thought it was so interesting that um, it describes what Nifty Gateway does very, you know, detailed and in legalese. So Nifty Gateway is an administrative platform that facilitates transactions between a buyer and a seller, but is not a party to any agreement between the buyer or seller of Nifty's or between any user. So they're very much a marketplace, not kind of getting in the way of the transaction, which I thought was interesting. They said they're very hands-off in these transactions. They want no part of it. Do you, I guess, does that mean they don't charge like a, a fee for using their platform or that still be applied to it? Well, I think we'll be going down further into that section, but um, yes, I believe there is a fee that's part of the transaction. Um, and it's actually part of every transaction, is how most of these companies work. We'll have to see once we get further on. But basically, the because you could like you, because you like you can track the sale of the digital good. Not only does the creator, like the original creator, get a cut, but I think it's like every time it, there, there's a sale, the marketplace can also take a cut if they want to. Sometimes some people kind of pay up front and once. So like if you're a creator, you pay like a one time fee of maybe you know two hundred dollars to be like your gas fee. So if, if you if you want to mint any more NFTs, um, that kind of covers you across your lifespan on the platform. So it's one of two ways. We'll find out further as we go down these terms of service, but it's either they're charging a gas fee for minting or they're probably taking a cut of the sale every time it's sold and resold because they can track that. That is really interesting. Where was this like back in like 2010? When everybody was just taking random screenshots off of like, what was it Getty images and creating memes <laughs> out of them? I mean, people Business are still doing cat? that today. <laughs> well, now, yeah, I mean, not to not to get on my 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 Clint Eastwood on a porch horse here of an old man being crotchety, but like now, memes are like Twitter posts with a picture underneath saying like they said this and this happened, but like back in the day, <laughs> it was an image and there was a format. 
<laughs> oh, I mean, it all depends on how you define that. I'm, I'm going to put a pin in that because we did a whole other conversation about about memes and what that uh, what that means. And you know what we'll do, Doug? We'll do a um, – maybe we'll do Reddit's terms of service or something like that. So that way we, we can just – instead of talking about the terms of service, we can talk about – the memes that are created on it. But I think the other thing I want to mention just in this brief section one about accepting the terms is um, how they define their non-fungible tokens. They have, they have a name for them. So it says these terms of use are set out. Let me rephrase that. These terms of use set out your rights and responsibilities when you use Nifty Gateway to buy, sell, or display non-fungible tokens, Nifties or Nifty. So they've essentially labeled nfts on their marketplace as nifties or nifty uh which i thought was pretty interesting kind of you know putting some branding around this um acronym and technology that's um well which which was once very unknown but now very much in the mainstream conversation because these things are going for millions of dollars other ones are just hundreds of thousands in a sense does make sense of why you would want to do that both from like a standpoint of like you want to be known Mm -hmm. um but if you've never seen it, I highly encourage you to take a look at the, I think it's Velcro, did a song about how they're called the hook and loop um, because they were going to lose their patent if people continue to call everything as a, every piece of hook and loop technology, we'll call it, even though it's like a piece of like plastic interlocking. Um you can basically lose your patent because it becomes like public domain. Same thing with like Kleenex being also known as like tissue, like t- tissues and Kleenex being synonymous Velcro and the hook and loop technology are synonymous. And so if it becomes so synonymous, you basically lose your ability to have um, the right over that name. Um, That's fascinating. Cause the goal of a lot of companies are to like become a verb, you know, to become commonplace. Didn't I, know there was a downside to that. Highly recommend the hook and loop song on YouTube. <laughs> um, it's like I think the I think the legal team had them do it. I don't know if they're actually the ones singing it, but it's fantastic, and it's like three minutes. <laughs> well, we'll we'll drop that in the show notes for this episode because um, yeah, I'm sure <laughs> that that can't be anything but an absolute steal. <laughs> so we'll take a look there. Uh, I think Doug, the other thing again back in the section one is that of course you set to set up an account, uh, basically just using their service in any way, shape, or form. You accept these terms of service, very standard protocol for um, a software service marketplace, whatever it might be. Um, there is an arbitration agreement, so we'll always call that out at, at the top of the show. If there is one, there is one here in section 18. We'll get to it, but only briefly. Uh, so just know that there is an arbitration agreement in these documents. Uh, and then lastly, I think this is something that's like just to bring up. Uh, it's pro- pretty commonplace across all terms of service, but um the company nifty gateway is able to change or modify these terms at any time in their social discretion and you understand and agree that when you log into your account or access the site for essentially any reason you accept to the change of any any changes that might be made uh, any revisions and in general just the overall terms of service so um you're very much uh there, there are really no barriers <laughs> when it comes to accepting. If you want to use the website in any way, shape, or form, you'll be accepting these terms terms of service. So that's kind of the the, the gist of section one here. Nothing too crazy, but a good baseline for the for the conversation. I fully agree. I'm curious, based off of that, what else is buried within this terms of use document? Um, well, shall we go exploring? We shall. Uh-huh. All right. Well, section two. Oh, May as well I, start there, right? I would love to. And if you wouldn't mind, let me uh, take a crack at the reading of this one. Well, Doug, I've, by all means, why don't you give it a go here? Section two, titled, Your Nifty Gateway Account. You need to create an account with Nifty Gateway to use the services. When you create an account, we will ask... Oh, uh, no, they have error. a typo. Okay. I was like, why, <laughs> am I, why am I having such a hard time with this section? <laughs> yeah, there's a like, spelling error. <laughs> okay. Well, look at that. We'll note that. We'll, we'll note that and tag them. Be like, hey, guys, there's a spelling mistake in your terms of service. I'm pretty sure you get docked points for that in terms of like, you, like your legal scoreboard across companies. Each spelling oh, mistake really? is like, minus, oh, that was a complete joke. Um, 
Oh man, that'd be awesome. We start making we 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 start making money off grammatical errors. That'd be like it'd, it'd be a bug bounty program. Are those a thing? Yeah, 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 yeah. The, the um, companies like big software companies like Twitter, for example, ha- has a bug bounty program. So there there are security research that go out and find vulnerabilities and bugs in Twitter's uh, code, uh, and they get paid you know thousands of dollars to identify them, bring them to Twitter's attention. Um, and so that way Twitter can fix, fix them and kind of improve their security. So That makes a ton of sense. Mm-hmm. Did you see, not to loop back to Reddit, even though we're on Nifty's terms of, terms of use, <laughs> um, that somebody in that vein found there was an issue in the, like the source code of Grand Theft Auto um, 5, in terms of how it loaded online and it was known for atrocious online loading times, like minutes long to load okay. into something. And somebody literally detailed out this like four page long of like what was wrong in their code. And it was like, uh, and no way do I understand anything about coding, but from what everybody mm-hmm. was saying is a very basic coding error that has affected this plot, this game for years. Um, and then GTA pulled it from them and was like, cool, we're going to fix this. Um, and then it, now loads in like under seconds now um, yeah that's incredible that, that's it's also one of those things that's like you know Q, qa i guess i mean qa will say it's development's fault development will say it's qa's <laughs> fault it's nobody ever wins in those arguments <laughs> oh somebody's not doing their job at some point in time um, <laughs> and that's just how life goes yeah isn't that true well, all right. So back, we've, back, we've, we've, we've really back. derailed from, it was literally a sentence and a half as much as I got <laughs> into the section. So I'm, I'm going to take it from the top. Your nifty gateway account section two, you need to create an account with nifty gateway to use services. When you create an account, we will ask for you for your, Oh my God. We will <laughs> ask crazy? you for some information about yourself. We're just going to blow past at this point. We may require you <laughs> in our sole discretion to provide additional information and or documents. If you do not provide complete and accurate information and or documents in response to such a request, we may refuse to provide you with the services. Your Nifty Gateway account is subject to the following conditions. Access. You understand and agree that access to your Nifty Gateway account is limited solely to you You agree that you will not sell, rent, lease, or grant access to your Nifty Gateway account to any person without prior written permission. I have never heard of the concept of renting out an online account. I have selling. Have have yeah? Have you ever played RuneScape? Well, I no. You sell an account. You 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 you, can sell an account. You can rent it out. Yeah. I mean, I guess to, to your point, yeah. You you can sell. It's more selling the RuneScape account. Yeah, like, you know, you get all that diamond gear on there, you're power leveling, you're getting it good, you're selling it <laughs> off, you know. It's great. Yeah, I've never, and like leasing too. Lease, a lease would imply like a legal agreement outside of this to say, this is when your lease ends on this account. Yeah, well, I mean, basically, the this is just the legally is covered in all spaces. It's one of those things where it's like, it's hard for us to imagine how, how that would work. And then until you see somebody's like make it happen on the internet somewhere, they're just like, mm, should probably put that into the terms and conditions to again, protect across as many potential opportunities or clever ways around the rules as possible. So, well, you know, no need to break your brain over what it could be from a leasing standpoint, but walk with me here for a second. Scott. <laughs> okay. Let's break some brains. Huh. <laughs> this as a, commodity is a digital commodity yep Ugh, I like- well i mean te- i mean technically maybe well it's it's your it's your account specifically like your account i mean maybe somebody's gonna lease or grant like grant access to somebody's like maybe maybe i have a bunch of really cool things that i don't want to sell to you but you want to display them somewhere or have some street cred or do something with them i could lease you my account to view those digital assets or host those digital assets or something. Okay. Now, do I have any idea how that would technically work where it's like I, I couldn't just change the password on you? No idea. Truly, I'm not that old. So I don't know why I'm having such a hard time bending my brain around how these new these new concepts in the world work. But I get the concept of owning an original artwork by somebody that was a famous painter during a time period. Get yep. it. Costs a lot of money. You don't get more than one of them. It's unique. This on itself, yes, they are unique, but 
I guess I don't get as much of what you can do with it unless there's going to be like NFT museums at one point in time and then yeah. you can lease them mm-hmm. out on like an NFT yeah. like virtual experience. But yeah, you're yeah, you're walking down the right alleyway. You know, digital showcasing on the internet. I mean, uh, uh, Mark Cuban has already f- f- founded or backed or invested in a startup that is specifically designed to start doing um, showcases online, music like uh, digital museums online. So it's a way in which you can showcase all your NFTs, no matter where you bought them from, on a, on a website. Basically, there's going to be a lot of interesting idea around digital ownership and kind of like what the new social profile is going to be and how it's all going to interact with these new digital objects like that are coming out. It's all very deep Web three stuff here, Doug. Well, I'd be curious if this then would like ever cross paths with like augmented reality or things like that. So like yeah. the NFTs mm-hmm. could like display. Yeah within yeah, yeah. your apartment or and you will be able to get to display it within that apartment or in that environment um yep and then i could see why you would want to be like you can't lease that future proofing yes yeah, so we're gonna have a big rabbit hole here so i'm i'm gonna bring us back into the next section which is security and this security section is basically the saying that uh you as an individual are responsible for the security of your account so what whether that's passwords bank accounts credit cards um you are the solely responsible for everything that happens with that and nifty can't be held responsible if there is a security breach across your account so again it's all to you oh here we go a section on trading fees let's see if we understand what they how they make money so it says trading fees by buying or selling a Nifty on Nifty Gateway, you agree to pay all applicable fees and you authorize Nifty Gateway to automatically deduct fees directly from your payment. So there seems like there are fees involved that are going to be transitioned to Nifty or a seller or, or whomever. But you will figure out what those fees are because they will always provide a breakdown of fees prior to your purchase or sale of a Nifty. Um, I thought this was kind of interesting, Doug. We have two things coming up here called USD balance and unclaimed property. Do you want to take the USD balance and I'll take the unclaimed property section? I'm happy to take the USD balance. I do want to loop back to the communication section at one point. Oh, okay. USD balance. Certain approved users may carry a balance in US dollars to facilitate transactions on the Nifty Gateway platform. You are the owner of your balance. Feel straightforward. Yeah. Tell me about communications. Well, I think I may have misread for a second i thought they were stating that they would keep your telephone email address um like for for a second i read it as like oh they're going to keep your telephone email address no matter what so they can keep you mm-hmm. current on any communications that they need to keep you current on and i was like whoa i don't think you just put it in there and just say that's okay um but i was incorrect in how i was reading that one but it is interesting that they say via electronic means so it just means email traditionally is email but the future proofing could be text because they, they explicitly call out that you need to keep it your telephone number current as well. And I would imagine yep. that texting would be a part of it. Yeah, absolutely. So this next section called unclaimed property, which I thought was really interesting. Never seen this before uh, across any other terms of service that uh, I have I have read. So it says, if Nifty Gateway is holding funds in your account and has no record of your use of the service for several years, they may be required upon passage of applicable time periods to report these funds as unclaimed property in accordance with the abandoned property and escrow laws. Fascinating. It's like if somebody's like opens an account, deposits a, like a bunch of cash in there, or I guess an ether, whatever it is, and then like it like gets locked out or forgets about it uh, or never comes back for it they can take it away or i well, i guess not take it away but go through the whole process of you know unclaimed property which i thought was just fascinating i don't know enough about unclaimed property laws to like have any other insight into the fact that you can't keep your money in there without a certain level of activity so good to know i agree with you i also don't know anything about abandoned property <laughs> no laws. idea like no i idea. have no idea that those even existed but it makes sense um and I'm curious how that type of stuff will develop over the next decade. Like that's not like it's gonna be like that part specifically seems like it could be an interesting development of like what will happen? Will people accept that um over time? Yeah. So something interesting thought I'd call it out. Uh, of course they will 
provide written notices and many follow-ups to get try and get in contact with you. So again, that's why it goes back to making sure you have things, or you know, not, not your things, but uh, making sure that you have your account information updated so uh, something like this doesn't happen to you and you don't lose all your stuff, uh, which depending on how things go in the years, could be worth a whole heck of a lot more than it is now or a whole heck of a lot less. All just kind of depends. I guess the next one here is just like how suspension. That's section three, standard, straightforward. If you do anything that breaks the terms of service or legal, they're going to suspend your account. Uh, and they also can suspend your account for no reason at all because it's up to their sole discretion to suspend to enact a suspension. So just know that, yes, you, you like your account can be suspended pretty straightforward quick easy all depends i like that they specifically call out money laundering in there that's oh that's a big concern with a lot of this digital you know digital currencies and stuff is that it's are people gonna use it for like illegal activities and money laundering the bar might be a little bit lower lower in terms of effort but money has been laundered for a very long time so i feel like when people would be like we're concerned about this being another route i'm like it's not there just the water then flows to somewhere else so like, I get why they're calling out in their in their terms of use. I if someone was to be like, "Oh, NFTs are bad because it's easier to launder money," it's like it's been happening for gosh, I don't even know how long. Forever, yeah, forever, yeah, probably forever. It's like, why do you think there are so many to like you know laundry machines at a laundromat? Some of them are for money. Have I ever told you? <laughs> oh, about- where's this going? <laughs> No, this is the episode of Doug has a lot of side stories. Um, <laughs> Apparently. You're welcome for this lovely story. But um, in the town that we moved to when we came down to North Carolina, my girlfriend noticed a ton of laundromats the first time she came down here, like all over the place on corners everywhere. Mm-hmm. And then we moved down here and like three months into me down here, there was a huge money laundering um uh, or it wasn't it wasn't laundromats it was mattress stores but there was literally a huge, oh, mattress stores. okay um money laundering circle that was going on in this town in North Carolina and i was the like, first time i was ever exposed to anything like that but yeah you just like put them up and then they those like fake cash of sales of mattresses um and like that's how they, that's, they just launder it through it was crazy to hear about i really thought it was going to be laundromats for laundering money which has just been a very absolutely just wild concept because well, depending do, on how much money do. you're trying to launder, they do uh, laundry match probably aren't 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 a good uh, cash flow source. And supposedly, they also sometimes actually do wash money in a laundry machine or something like that. I think maybe I'm just maybe I'm just construing <laughs> an episode of a TV one I watched one time like an actual concept. <laughs> but I definitely remember something like I think it was like weeds or something like that. Like somebody threw a big cash like big bag of cash into a laundry oh, machine I'm sure. and like yeah. washed it to try and get the fingerprints off of it. Um, but outside of that riveting side story and account suspension, I would like to talk about the communication section. Oh, okay. So now we can go back to... Oh, no. It's, it's the next one. Section four. Oh, it's the next one. Oh, wow. All communication. Right. Go ahead, Doug. Take it, take it away. When you... In their terms of use here on section four communication you agree that we may send you promotional communications by email including but not limited to newsletters special offers surveys and other news and information we think will be of interest to you you agree that we may send you communications by email or text that pertain to the status of the purchase or sale of a nifty on nifty gateway and other communications that pertain to your interaction with the website including but not limited to notifications about the status of nifty you are interested in purchasing. You may opt out of promotional communications at any time by following the instructions provided therein. They do not now provide instructions, but uh, <laughs> not even a link. Well, it's probably within when you first sign up, there's probably a button or something that you click that says, yes, I will opt in for, or I will opt out of communications. Well, so here's, here's what's interesting about all this to me. You're mm-hmm. right. I normally see it as a checkbox to like opt in out and it's very explicitly called out. But was it section one? Basically you sign up and you agree that if you're using their account, you agree to their terms of use. And then in here they say that we're going to send you promotional emails. So to opt out, you would really have to not use their service. Um, under, you may opt out. You may opt out. I, th- it, all around it's weird language i've never seen anything kind of like this i've only ever seen um 
transactional, like the second thing they talk about in terms of like how they'll communicate with you around your purchase or sale of like using the service, something that's transactionally related to you to be a required um, communication. I've never really seen promotional things be included in terms of use before. Promotion can be, can be anything. Sometimes promotion can just be like, cause like there's like, there's obviously that like there's kind of operating procedure stuff. Like here's your account confirmation. And like, yes, you bought something like here's your confirmation receipt. They also want the uh, permission to send you marketing, marketing material of like, Hey, check out this deal or Hey, check out these new things happening on the website or whatever it might be. There's kind of different lines of communication, but promotional can be kind of put into a like a bunch of buckets like sale 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 and here's what's new in the platform or here's something that they might be interested in i suppose you're correct that it can be defined in multiple ways i personally prefer a more explicit call out on promotional content outside of a terms of use myself well let's move on to section five here doug user content oh, we can move on to section five but i am also going to be fascinated by or section six of ownership because this whole concept of owning things digitally i want to hear more about but please all right we'll, regale we'll, we'll, us. we'll keep section <laughs> section five will be pretty 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 straightforward so this is section five user content um brief overview of the section here first paragraph so the site allows for one users to create a profile where they can post certain information about themselves, link to other websites, and display nifties they own. So collectively, which is this that kind of collective is called uh, profile information. And then two artists or creators of nifties, titled nifty creators, uh, can post their nifties, which are their nifty creations, uh, and bios, which is collectively the profile information and user content excuse me, all user content must comply with these terms. Uh, so then it goes forth and kind of outlines the different types of requirements for user content. Uh, a lot of it is pretty standard. It's really all about making sure you have the proper licenses, copyright um, you know, permissions, IP permissions, that if you make anything, you own it, you're the sole creator of it. And if you are doing something that might be infringing a copyright that you have the proper permissions to do so uh, and the paperwork to back that up. What I thought was most interesting is that they kind of highlight a section here about nifty creators in particular um, and some of the rights that are um, given to nifty gateway itself. If you're a creator on their platform here. So it says if you are a nifty creator, you hereby grant nifty gateway the right to use your name and image for marketing and promotional purposes. If you are a nifty creator, you you agree that we may use or modify images from the nifties that you create for marketing or promotional purposes, and that you also agree that they can use your uh, biography as well as other public information about you to promote the nifties that you create. This is only the second episode I've been on, and I've read a few the like I've read a few documents like this for work. But the more I read about these, more I'm like, man, I probably shouldn't just click accept every single time. <laughs> <laughs> like there are probably some services that I've signed up for in my life that weren't worth it in terms of accepting what I accepted when I signed up for that service. Do you know, one of my, the most interesting things I found embedded in terms of service was that Netflix can take your downloaded content off of your phone. If you're in a country where they, they don't have copyright um, or IP rights to that content. So you've downloaded it. And if you go online through like Wi-Fi, they're able to pull that content off of your phone or like or not keep, or, or block access to it until you're back in a country where they have the, the IP rights to actually serve that content. That is super interesting. I am. Yeah dying to know if they can actually do that. Um, or like if they have or had any reason to. Yeah, I'm curious if it's kind of like they they put it in there said we're going to do it and then like they then they don't yeah, actually it's do cut, it. Cut, covering their bases, but it's in there. Super interesting. Um, I think in general, what this the section about the creator is probably a benefit. Like if you're creating on the platform, like that's kind of like oh great, you know they will help promote my stuff as long as there's credit due back, which that's TBD. It doesn't say that they have, they have to give you credit for any marketing or promotional material. Just that like they can, if you make it really cool, nifty, they can technically rip it 
and put it into their material. I'm sure they'll, like they'll credit the creators because obviously they want to build a good relationship with them, but um, just something to be aware of. And not to worry, you have ownership of that nifty that they're ripping off and putting in their marketing promotional stuff. So they know that that's your nifty. That's that's very, very true. I also thought this was interesting. Again, a, a lot of this, the things I think I find interesting are kind of tailored towards the creators themselves versus the buyers. And it says here, uh, you will not coordinate pricing with other nifty creators. So like kind of doing like like a price fixing scheme, saying that we're going to all sell our nifties at the same price. thought that was just kind of funny. Um, and then of course, as uh, a term service does when it comes to user content, Nifty Gateway has the sole discretion to remove any content on their platform uh, without any you know, reasoning. It's all at their sole discretion. They don't have to police it. They don't have to remove things, but they will if there are certain things that violates the type of content they allow. To be honest, I think I'm going to be stewed on a lot of this stuff. You know, this is a big, this is a big first exposure to the concept of NFTs as a whole. Well, let's just kick into section six here, which is all about ownership. But Doug, you're going to be disappointed because this is more about the ownership of the Nifty Gateway brand and its likeness and its aesthetic and style versus the ownership of a digital asset. I'm immensely disappointed. I'll still read it because I feel like it will be a good fit for the podcast as a whole, but you are correct. That does not intrigue me as much as it once did. This is only section six. There there are 18 sections of this one, and I think there are some more interesting ones if we keep scrolling down. So you can read this, but maybe can I tempt you with a little read of section seven, Terms of Sale? which is a bit more interesting and related to the consumer and how things are bought and sold. I would be happy to give this a read. Well, all right. Give it a read, Doug. Section 7, Terms of Sale. By placing an order on Nifty Gateway, you agree that you are submitting a binding offer to purchase the non-fungible token Nifty. Nailed it. Or service from Nifty Gateway LLC. Your order is accepted and confirmed once purchase is complete. And Nifty Gateway displays the confirmation page. You hereby expressly agree that, you su- that the supply of Nifty begins immediately after the confirmation play- page is displayed. No refunds are permitted except with respect to any statutory warranties or guarantees that cannot be ex- excluded or limited by law. A few things here. One, you like to read a lot. I do. Reading legal documents is crazy hard to read. That, and I've never been great with words. Uh, Do you know how many words I mispronounce because I learned them by reading as a kid? A ton. Like, there's words I get wrong constantly. Now, as for this actual section, it is kind of interesting, but it also makes sense once you buy it. It becomes yours as soon as that confirmation page is displayed. It's no different than like when the cash register rings it up in the store and you put that credit card in and this is approved or you hand that $20 bill over. It's the same thing. What would be interesting though is like, this would be like super edge case, but if like somebody bought like a $2 million EF or uh, uh, NFT. <laughs> an EF, an, an EFT. <laughs> an EFT, you know, um, but an NFT, $2 million and that confirmation did page didn't display because like tech goes wrong. It could yeah. happen. Overall, it does make sense, though. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's interesting because, like, that last line, it says, you hereby expressly agree that the supply of Nifty begins immediately after the confirmation page is displayed is in all caps. I think understanding that distinction of when the transaction happens, because, like, like, the, like, the digital goods, right? Like, you're not transferring any like, any physical object. Like, nothing's being shipped. Um So understanding like exactly when the transaction is completed and when the ownership is translated, uh, it's something kind of interesting to think about, like what, you know, what dictates that. Uh, And so here we go, right when the confirmation page is displayed. So, well, I'm so curious and I know this is probably like me just not knowing NFTs, but what do you do with an NFT when you buy it? Why, why so, why are you so caught up in what do you do with it? It's partially because I'm unprepared for this podcast. (laughs) <laughs> which is i mean listen there's no way to really prepare for these things you just kind of read them and see what happens and the other part is is just a really fascinating concept to actually like think about all of like the you can now limit the supply of a digital good by saying it's unique based off of how nfts work because i already revealed in the start of this i don't understand anything about how blockchains work so i don't really delve back my toes <laughs> back into that pool about where i don't know things um 
<laughs> but I'm just curious, but like there has to be on the other side of that fence demand. Um, yeah. Thanks to a one economics course for this all to like continue to rise up. And so I'm curious what the demand will be for these things that are going to be bought. Like I clearly it exists already because companies are being sprung up. Yeah. Well, I mean, the best way to describe it is like this. I made a pineapple, tropical pineapple NFT on a nifty gateway competitor, OpenSea. It's currently, well, it was going for three Ether, which is now $12,000. So I got to do a price adjustment there. But nobody's bought it because there's no demand for Scott Elterson's NFT, pineapple NFT for twelve grand. The parallel could be similarly the art like world like you don't really make it until you make like there could be right totally totally. there could be a a, 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 there's there there are going to be thousands probably tens of thousands of people that are making nfts and from like an art standpoint that will never sell will be you know going for a dollar two dollars um you know there's a there's a podcast that makes nfts is for like their own shits and giggles because they're an nft podcast so every every episode they make a new gerbil that podcast is called non fun gerbils. It's hysterical, right? They kind of have it in like that community sense. I guess it does make more sense when you put in that framework. It's the same thing exactly that's happening in the physical world. You could essentially have something that does a whole collection of NFTs, love artwork. Like if you're just a, if you're somebody that's really good at art and does a whole collection of NFTs, you could sit on them for 40 years and then one day get a ton of cash. Yeah, but that, that but that's with like like any art. But this is one sliver of what NFTs can be used for. Core technology is going to do more than just this in this realm of like art collectibles. But this is where we see this seen like the first consumer use case. Well, yeah, it makes sense. I mean, I for me personally, it's easier to grasp on to something that's very easily connectable to a concept I already understand, which is like art. Yep, totally. I get yeah, it. Totally. Um, totally. Where it becomes fun is like once you really get that first concept, is like, well, how can we? to your point expand beyond that because you're right like like if you get like nft source code that'd be kind of fun i don't even know if that would make any sense but like well now this gets into the whole idea of like what, what we, like like the smart contract because you can write anything into the smart contract what in the world is a smart contract oh doug there's there's so many there's so many more layers below this on the ethereum blockchain the smart contract is essentially a piece of code that writes what the nft is like writes what the block is gives all the code in there to, to, like details the ownership so you can make a non-fungible token of like anything of like any media asset of any code asset right very easily you can just kind of go in there and type a bunch of source code you can put in like a bunch of images pictures gifs audio you know you can put like a deed to like a house in there if you wanted to uh, you can put any, anything that you can type into a computer or like a media file. It, it, it can all be stored in a smart contract, which then becomes like the ledger or not. Well, not even like the ledger, but like the base of what the NFT is and what you own on it. And technically, if you want to get real detailed. The smart contract just says that you own this thing. But a lot of these media assets live on a separate server that's outside of the blockchain. So it says I own this media asset, but let's say Nifty Gateway goes down, uh, they they go bankrupt. I can still own that asset. I own the original, but maybe I've lost the media file to it. So there, 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 there's a whole issue around that as well. That doesn't seem terribly far off from the concept of buying a movie on iTunes. Sure, you bought that movie and you own a copy of that movie on your device. But if Apple were ever to go down and like go bankrupt and their servers got turned off, you don't own that movie anymore. Um, well, you do if you download it to your computer. Would you though? Because you'd probably download to iTunes and iTunes would go away. But you see the point I'm getting at though. It's not t- like now you're basically saying instead of buying on iTunes a copy of Lord of the Rings. You're buying mm-hmm. the you're buying the right of ownership of the original film itself, yeah. and like you own yeah. that now. Correct, correct. You're not buying a copy. You're buying the original. You're buying the original, which didn't exist prior. Like you couldn't ever do that digitally prior to this, unless you were buying something physical and getting it shipped via eBay, like an Obi Wan's lightsaber yeah. or something like that. 
I get the idea of like, oh, you don't, like, you're not, you don't really own it because it's on a server somewhere. But at the same time, like, do we own anything that's digital? Like, when you own, we buy an Xbox game that you don't have a disc for, do you own it? No, you own the right to download it. Well, you know, Doug, we'd have to go in and read those terms of service and see how they define it. Because if you look at Disney's terms of service and Netflix terms of service, you don't, you, you can buy a, a, a movie off of Disney Plus, but you don't own it. You just essentially pay a, pay a licensing fee to view it. But with this, you like you do own it. Like you own, you have like, like you have the piece of paper that says I own, you know, one of 25 pineapple NFTs made by Scott Elderson. And this one, because it's number one, you know, I'm going to associate it with a $12,000 value, but number 35 is worth a dollar. And it goes in that, and it kind of plays in, in the, into that idea of like collectibles and what people assign value to. Uh, and sure, people can kind of like copy, paste, or, you know, screenshot the piece of asset that I own, but they don't own the original that's worth, like they don't own the certificate that says this is worth $12,000. So like that certificate is worth $12,000. The image itself, the media URL is not worth $12,000. It's the smart contract that's on the on the Ethereum blockchain that is worth and dictates the money that that, you know, whatever, or holds the value. Agreed. And that's what's so interesting for me about this whole, con- is like you, you can now own something originally via the blockchain. And that's really cool. That's, I mean, this terms of services or terms of use is boring. The, what it represents is really cool. <laughs> so this is actually a good way for us to skip to section 14 very quick, which is disclaimers, because they have a paragraph in here, all caps, so you know it's important. That's my assumption when I see all that. Uh, and it's all about this idea of like the assets themselves, right? So very quickly, it says, nifties are intangible digital assets. They exist only by the virtue of the ownership record maintained in the Ethereum network. Any transfer of title that may occur in any unique digital asset occurs on the decentralized ledgers within the Ethereum platform. Uh, Nifty does not guarantee that Nifty Gateway or any other Nifty Gateway party can affect the transfer of title or right in any Nifties. Basically, what what they're saying is that when a sale happens, they can't like reverse it, like they like they like they can't impact that transaction because it's it's not up to them to verify it. Right? It's the whole community out there that's going to verify the transaction. It's how I'm reading that. It could be a little bit wrong, but I thought that, that was interesting. That makes and, sense. And it kind of goes into this idea of like how things are translated and owned and operated in this decentralized manner. I do have a question related to NFTs again. Um, <laughs> they specifically call it the Ethereum network here. Yeah. To me, that implies there might be a separate network if they're calling it a specific. Oh, there are multiple, there are multiple different blockchains. Can you maintain an NFT across multiple different NFT network, like blockchain networks? Uh, right, so my knowledge is limited when it comes to that. In general, all NFTs are built on Ethereum because they allow for smart contracts, which is the key thing that is needed for a um, NFT to happen. So if other blockchain networks to, were, were to adopt smart contracts... Maybe I, I, if they're interoperable, then it, I guess it would be fine. But like, there's no need to like go put your smart contract on another blockchain. Like, there's no need to. It's just a ledger. It says, "Yeah, Scott owns this number one of 35 pineapple NFTs." I can still display my the the interoperability is going to be like with the media asset and being like, "Who owns it over here?" And you know, where can I display it? I I mean, I think I don't know. If people are listening. If you're still awake, let us. Let us know your thoughts on that one. I'm not. I'm, I'm not sure. I would be. I am thrilled that I get to put my voice on the internet because I'm all about being corrected and where I'm wrong in terms of technology. <laughs> and it happens constantly. <laughs> oh, so there's no faster way to find out you're wrong than putting your opinion out. Oh, on there's the no. Yeah, <laughs> you'll yeah. get a response in under like ten seconds. So there's section twelve, I thought was interesting too. Uh, risks. Basically, they're saying the. Price and liquidity of blockchain assets, including nifties, are extremely volatile. So it might be worth a lot one day. It might be worth nothing the next day. So just be aware of how this works 
and these large pricing, you know, these large price fluctuations, because you might be pretty disappointed if you spend hundred thousand dollars and all of a sudden it's worth way less. Not to immediately jump to another section, but I section twenty one survival. You, as a long standing host of this podcast, are you familiar with sections like this of survival? Yes. So again, survival, and not in the sense that if you die, um, no, it's I, about. I would imagine oh, it's related on. to the company itself, correct? Like, so it says no. You it's, agree. Specific, well, it's it's specifically related to the terms of service. Hmm. Yeah. So basically, wait, every severability. Uh, oh, well, there's severability, and then there's survival. So every survival section just says that if you leave a. So let's say like I close my account on Nifty Gateway, and I withdraw all my money i have no longer anything attached to it because i opened an account and i agreed to these terms of service even after i terminate my account close everything out these terms of service will still govern um any disputes any interactions anything when it comes to nifty gateway like anything basically the relationship between me and nifty gateway so like that like, that, like that's all it's saying so it's basically saying that like you can't close everything out and then go sue them and be like, oh, these terms of service don't, like, don't apply to me because I don't have an account. Because you already had an account, the terms will apply to you. Even if you close it out, even if you are you know haven't touched it in 10 years, they'll still apply. Even though you've been erased from the servers and everything. Huh. That's interesting. I didn't know that. So that's that's survival. Um, I mean, the rest of it, you know, again, like like these bottom half. Usually, what happens is once you hit like section, I don't know, fourteen, because usually these have like in anywhere from yeah maybe like twenty to twenty five sections in total. Uh, but right around section fourteen, normally is when it's all the standard cookie cutter legalese. It's the arbitration agreement, which, as we mentioned, this one has. It has governing law, which is basically the jurisdiction in which you'll go to court if there's some sort of disagreement, which for Nifty Gateway, it's going to be the federal courts of New York. So just be aware of that. Yeah, I mean, that's really, I would say, all the interesting points of what Nifty Gateway, what this one's got for us here. Um, I mean, Doug, anything else? Thoughts? Are you still just stewing about ownership of digital assets? <laughs> a little bit, if I'm being completely honest. This podcast, I'm sure it is going to put a lot of people to sleep. This is going to keep me up at night, um, <laughs> personally. <laughs> it's a fun thing to think about. You can use it for your book. Probably. Yeah. If you wanted to sell digital copies of your book, you could sell them through like an, like an NFT. This is this is where the world gets real interesting really quickly. Um, <laughs> I could technically I could I could put a book on like the original copy of a book on there and sell the original copy online, and then do it in the physical one as well. If I print out this first physical copy as well, you can get the first NFT versus physical. Or you can like not put the original, but you can put copies and make those NFTs. So that way you can so it's like yeah I'm gonna sell access to. 3,000. 3,000 first editions. 3,000 first editions. Think about that, you know. You're, you're, you're going to be up tonight. <laughs> I can tell. <laughs> Without a doubt. <laughs> well, if anybody's looking to get in contact with Nifty Gateway, uh, their email is support at niftygateway.com. Uh, it's probably the best way to get in contact with them. Uh, but yeah, so I hope everybody's asleep. Um Doug, as always, it's an absolute pleasure with you, talking to you, learning more about these wacky, wild uh, legal agreements that nobody reads. Uh, and I think, you know, we might just be learning some things along the way. So thank you, everybody, and enjoy your night.